السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام وعليكم السلام بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله اللهم زدنا علما ولا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب We praise and we glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves and we send peace and blessings on our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his noble family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the highest maqam station that he has granted to any of his creation and make him a means of intercession of Shafa for us on the Day of Judgment and grant us his companionship in Jannah and give us the privilege and blessings of drinking from his hand at his Haud from the springs of Kawthar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take you and your family and all of us to his house again and again and again and to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. <coughs> <coughs> so with that spirit of feeling the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his house of being in Makkah and being with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his presence, now let's transport ourselves back because when we study the Quran and today we are scheduling on our schedule is to study the 36th surah which is surah Yasin. We need to move back in history and physically back to Mecca at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To understand the Qur'an properly, we have to understand the context of the real-time revelation as the Qur'an was being revealed. So we have to understand that, that this was the circumstance, this was the place, this were the pe these were the people, this is what they were experiencing when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this. So it gives it a new meaning and added meaning because that's how it came. That was the specific time that it was revealed. And then the general understanding, because the Quran is for all times, how does it apply to us today, living where we are? So for a complete understanding of the Quran, we have to always go back to that reference of where it was revealed, when it was revealed, what they were going through. So with that in mind, Surah Yasin is from what is considered the mid Makkan period, the early part of that. So you might say we don't know exactly, but somewhere around year four of Nabuwa, still early to mid part of the Makkan period. <clears throat> like the rest of the Quran, this is a very special surah. There are some narrations about its benefits, about its fadail. And I will just mention them. Some of those narrations are considered weak. Weak doesn't mean that they are false. It just means that the authentication standards are, they don't meet those criteria on some of these narrations. But that doesn't mean that they don't, because there are enough of them that support each other. So in a narration narrated by Imam Bazar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li kulli shay'in qalban wa qalbu qur'ani yaseen. Which means that everything has a heart. And you know how important the heart is. And he said the heart of the Qur'an is yaseen. Continuing in that hadith, then he said, Wadattu annaha fi qalbi kulli insanin min ummati. I would love that this surah be in the heart of every one of my ummah, which is an encouragement for us to memorize this. 
be it in our hearts, by memory and by actions that we feel close to it. And it's only 83 ayahs, and they're short. So just like we did with Surah Kahf, my challenge to you is that in the six or seven, eight weeks that we cover the surah, that's enough time. If it takes us six weeks or eight weeks, that's 56 days to memorize 83 ayahs. And I'm sure many of you already know it, but that's the encouragement. In another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is narrated by Imam Abu Dawood, he said, Iqra'u Yasin ala mawtakum. Recite Surah Yasin on your dying. When people are dying, it will give them consolation. It reminds them. It gives them some peace in those difficult moments of death. So this, the scholars have said that you recite it when they are dying, if they have just died, and even after, with the niya of, the reward of this should go to the deceased. Because it calms them down and it has the scenes of the barzakh and what is coming ahead. So it's not like they are going to it. It's a reminder for them that this, these are the stages that you, this soul, your soul is going to go through. So it's not unfamiliar territory. You know what you're going to be going through. In another narration, narrated by Imam Tirmidhi and Darimi, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li kulli shayin qalban, the same, wa qalbu Qurani yaseen, the same beginning, that everything has a heart, and the heart of the Qur'an is yaseen. Wa man qara'a yaseen, katab allahu lahu bi qara'atiha qira'atu al-Qur'ani ashara marrat. Whoever recites Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the recitation of Yasin gives him the reward equivalent to having recited the entire Quran ten times. Okay. So this is another encouragement for us to recite Surah Yasin frequently. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qara'a surat Yasin fi laylatin Whoever recites Surah Yasin in the night, seeking the pleasure, the countenance of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him that night. And in another narration, Man qara'a surat Yasin fi laylatin asbaha maghfuran lah. That whoever recites this comes out of it in the morning like a forgiven. So these are all encouragements to read Surah Yasin. <coughs> Imam At-Tabari in his tafsir says, and I don't know the source of this, but it's in his book. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote Surah Taha and Yasin a thousand years before he created the universe. And when the angels heard Taha and Yasin being recited and written on Lauh al Mahfuz, they said, Blessed be the Ummah to which it will be sent. Blessed are the minds that will bear it, and blessed are the tongues that will recite it. Because it was so amazing to them. So, it is revealed in Makkah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is conveying his message. And the message is meeting with resistance. They are calling him names. What are they calling him? A poet, liar, majnoon. They are saying he invented it. He is being taught by jinns. All of those things. And who is saying it? One person? This one is saying it, that one, is, everyone is saying this. His uncle is saying this. His relatives are saying this. His tribe is... Now imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at that beautiful heart. And he is conveying the message of Allah. And this is what he's meeting with. How difficult it must be for him. 
even his loved ones. And there are a handful of Muslims, and they are hearing this, and they are being persecuted, they are being ridiculed. So this is the environment in which it was revealed. And it is stated that one of the chiefs of the Quraysh, in one narration it says, it was Ubay ibn Khalaf. He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was sitting there, and he brought some disintegrating bones of a, probably an animal, not a human being. And then in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he crushed them with his hands, and they became like dust, and he sort of did this. Just imagine, he is sitting there, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he crushes it and makes dust of it. And then he ridiculously, sort of arrogantly says, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, do you claim that Allah will give life to this, this dust from these bones? This is the because this was the biggest difficulty that they were having. They believed in Allah. They had other gods to reach Allah, but they believed. But they couldn't fathom that we would be brought back to life, that there is life after death, that there is a resurrection. We are, you know, we will be brought back. So he did this. So Rasulullah looked at him, and the question was, Do you claim that Allah will give life to this? He looked at him and he said, yes. Then he said, he will give life to it. He will then resurrect you and <coughs> enter you into Jahannam. Now that itself, for Rasulullah to say that, he didn't say anything out of his own self. That means Allah had already told him that this man will never accept Islam. Now, this itself is a miracle because that man was trying to prove that he is false, a false messenger. To prove him wrong when he said, you will enter Jahannam, he could say, Ashadu Allah, falsely, Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. I should enter Jannah, you are saying I enter Jannah. Do you understand? But Allah did not allow him to even say that. So, in response to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses which are towards the end, which will come in a few weeks, the verses 77 to 79. Perhaps I will just pull those up of, of what those verses were. So, that's why some have said that this was revealed in response to this. And the verses are, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانَ أَنَّ خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ does man not consider what that we created him from a drop of sperm? Then he became a clear, arrogant adversary. He says of his own creation and he forgets an example and he gives this this argument that can decomposed bones come back to life? That's what he had said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul to the Rasulullah Say to him, what? Yuhyi awwala marra wa huwa bi kulli khalqin alim. Say that he will give them life. The one who produced them the first time and he has power over all creation, all knowing. So, one of the asbab or nuzul or occasion of revelation was in response to this uh, challenge from this person. So, Makkan surahs have certain themes, and the themes have to do with iman, imaniyat, beliefs, because there were no commandments being given do this, don't do that. At that time, Iman was being built. So, Iman, Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in this surah. Revelation, Risala is in this surah. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his messengership is in this surah. The Akhirah, Qiyamah is in this surah. So, all of the articles of, of faith that we believe in are in here. And therefore, in a way, 
All the rest of the Quran is a detail of this, which so is the heart of the Quran in that way. Okay. And the Jannah and Nar and what happens. Now, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending revelation? What is the goal of revelation? The goal of revelation is so that people believe. They reach the truth. And they have no excuse that we didn't know. What is the truth? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a case for believing, acceptance of the truth by using three approaches. How does Iman come? One, Iman is built, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, tadabbur means reflection, reflect on the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the written ayats of the Qur'an that you reflect on them. You read them, you reflect. And the ayat, everything you see in front of you is an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look outside, the skies are an ayah. Every tree, every flower, every grass, every person sitting in front of you. Whatever you see in front of you, my hands, are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize him. So one way of getting Iman, the Haqiqah, the reality of it, the truth, is by seeing Allah's creation, that this cannot be created by itself. So that is one. The second is by learning history, from history. What happened to previous messengers? What happened to previous <laughs> nations? Okay. And the Quran is full of stories of previous Anbiya, previous nations. We hear over and over about Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, Dawud alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam, Saleh alayhi salam, all of them and different nations. <coughs> this happened in Madian, this happened here. So that we may learn from those lessons and not make the same mistakes. So the second way of building that Iman is knowing that Allah's help comes with his messengers, with his deen. So that's another way of looking back in history and building Iman. And the third is the revelation itself, what Allah has sent as guidance. So <clears throat> when we read the Quran, we should reflect on what we are reading. It's also a reminder. And then there are ayats which call for action. You need to do this. The ayats that call to Iman are calling for action of the heart because Iman is in the heart. So there are certain sections, if you look into the surah, the first 12 ayats is actually an address to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and if you look at the theme, it is a wake-up call. It's a call to Iman, to people who hear this, to believe. Now, who is the audience that this Quran is being revealed to at this time? Number one, because we'll see in the, right in the beginning, the address is to Rasulullah So he is the audience. He is being addressed directly. The second audience is the Quraysh, because he recites it to the Quraysh, these Majority of people who do not believe, who are idol worshippers, who are ridiculing him. And the third address is to the handful of believers who have believed the message. And there may be some people in whose hearts there is an inclination towards that this is the truth. So this is more proof coming to them so that they may come into Islam. <clears throat> so this is the first part of it. <clears throat> That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us to the truth. Belief in Tawheed, the Akhra, Risala, and all of that. How? By revelation, by sending the Quran, by sending the greatest message, the Quran, the greatest messenger, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Coming from whom? Al Aziz ar Rahim, the mighty and merciful, okay? the powerful. The second portion of this, the second section from Ayahs 13 to 32, I don't know how much we'll reach, is a story, again, history, Ashabul Qariya, about people of the town. 
a historical fact of what happened to a particular town to whom Allah sent messengers. Now, why is this put here? When we come to that, we will talk about it. And after that comes about 11, 12 ayahs about the signs of Allah in his creation. Allah reminds us of his creation. Again, another means to reach the truth. So the first part is about revelation. Second part is about history. And the third is about, what's the third part? Signs of creation. So all three ways in which Iman can be built. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put here in the first. Then there are a few ayats after that which talk about the attitude of man in general. How people, when a message comes, messenger comes, how they act because of their way of life, because of their arrogance. And then there are, there's a portion about the resurrection, the qiyamah and the hereafter. And it concludes with another argument about the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are some of the, <coughs> the uh, sections that we will cover. <coughs> now we start. Any questions so far on this introduction? Everybody still awake? The lights are dim. Yes. So you're saying that we can take the 83 uh, ayah and divide into three sections of four So eight. this is how the themes, because things change. So, yeah. you know, these are approximately where things change. Okay. What was the time period uh, these were revealed in? Is, we don't know. We told you an approximate time frame. Uh, what It was probably not all revealed at one time, but over a period of time. Okay. <clears throat> so, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yaseen Wal Quran al Hakim. Everybody's memorized these two ayahs. Now you've got only 81 left. <laughs> Everybody got these two? <laughs> Yaseen. What is Yaseen? What are they called? Huruful muqatta'at, disconnected huruf, alphabets. And the scholars have all agreed that the real meaning of this is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if we look at that, in the Arabic language, there are how many alphabets? 29. 14 out of those 29, half, are huruful, used as huruful muqattarat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the alphabet soup and just taken half of it and put it in the beginning of how many surahs? 29 surahs. Isn't that interesting? 29 alphabets are in the beginning of 29 surahs, but he's used 14. Sometimes it's just one alphabet, such as oh. Noon, we did that, Qaf. Sometimes it's two, such as oh, yeah. Yaseen, we did, Hamim, Taha. Sometimes it's three, most common. Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five. So, <clears throat> interestingly, wherever this comes, except in one place, the next ayah has something to do with the Qur'an. It mentions the Qur'an in one way or the other. <coughs> so one observation is that the Qur'an is made up of, it's a, Recitation, it is made up of what? Alphabets. And Allah has challenged the kuffar because they said this is not divine. Produce something like it. You can't. Second challenge, produce a surah like it. Here are the alphabets. Alif, Lam, Mim, Taha, Yasin. Use the alphabets and produce something like it. If you can't, then produce ten ayats. 
and that has never been done. So it could say that Allah is giving you, here you are. Another way of looking at it is that this is another proof of the Risala of Rasulullah Proof that he is the messenger. How is that? Because we, the people, the Quraysh are not hearing this from Allah SWT. They are hearing it from the tongue of the noble tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now he comes. He says, "Yasin wal Quran al Hakim, Alif Lam Mi Taha." Who is reciting this? One who does not know alphabets. He does not read. He does not write. He only knows language. He can speak, but he doesn't know that there is Ta, there is Ha. He just speaks it, and yet when he's Speaks, he gives alphabets. Therefore, it couldn't come from him. Somebody may never studied Urdu and they can talk, never went to school. You put it in front of them, they can't read it. He said, What is this? He said, it's a line. What is this with a dot? It's a line with a dot. But they don't know the alphabets, yet they can speak. He couldn't read or write. Remember when they erased in the Treaty of Hudaybiya? Okay, erase it. Where is it? He said, Ali, you erase it. He didn't know the alphabets and yet he's recited. So in a way, it's an indirect proof that it wasn't from him. Some have said that Yasin is one of the names of Rasulullah because of what comes after that. There is one surah, which is surah Rum, in which Alif Lam Mim is not followed by mention of the Quran. It's interesting. But what does it come as? What does it start with? Alif Lam Mim? Ghulibat Rum. The Romans. Please disconnect your, uh, mute your. Romans have been defeated. How does that link in with everywhere else is the Quran? It does. You know how? Because the Romans and the Persians had fought a battle in which the Persians completely decimated the Romans. Nothing left, destroyed. And this re revelation is saying that they have been defeated, but within Bida Sinin, within two to nine years, the Romans will defeat the Persians. It's making a prediction, a very bold prediction. Okay. And it's not giving a long time frame. In other words, it's putting out that this is what's going to happen. This is what the Quran, the whole Authenticity of the Quran is dependent on this. Suppose it didn't happen in nine years, you could say the whole Quran is false. So it still had to do with the revelation in a way. Did everybody understand that point? Mm -hmm. So these things require reflection, and our scholars have reflected on these. That's it. Okay. So Imam Ibn Kathir took these 14 alphabets. And he made it into a sentence. Just those alphabets. Nasun hakimun qat'un lahu sir. These are the 14 alphabets. Nasun. Nas means text. Hakimun, wise. Qat'un means definitive. Lahu, which has sir, wonderful secret. Isn't that beautiful? Put those 14 together into a sentence, those alphabets, that's what this is. And the meaning of that becomes a wise, decisive text full of wonderful secrets. That's one description of the Quran. Amazing. That's why we have scholars. Okay.
Next ayah, Wal Quran al Hakim. As we said, whenever Allah Swan starts with this is called Wow of Qasam, Allah is taking an oath. Quran al Hakim. Allah says, I swear, I take an oath by the Quran which is Hakim. And we've said before, when Allah Swan does not need to take any Qasam or oath, when He does it, there is an intent behind it. First, intent is to give, grab your attention, you know, because you're distracted. Allah is taking an oath, what is coming now, you know, so it grabs your attention. Number two, to give the importance of what is coming, which is called the jawab al qasam, that the oath is being taken on something about something. Okay. So the oath that is taken on something is given an honor that Allah swore by the morning, He swore by the night, He swore by this. Here Allah is swearing by the Quran. That is the ultimate honor. And He's calling it Hakim. And it prepares us to what is it so important that's coming that Allah is swearing by the Quran and that's going to come. And lastly, when Allah takes something as an oath on something, that becomes a proof and a witness. Allah swears, wal asr, the time will be evidence on the day of judgment. The Quran will be evidence, as it says, for or against people. So when Allah has taken an oath, just remember that the Quran is going to be brought as evidence and it will give evidence of what you did with the Quran. And this mention in the Quran that they say, yeah, they abandoned the Quran. Okay. They knew it, didn't act upon it or they acted upon it. So it is the Quran will be in favor or in against. So when Allah takes an oath, just remember that also. Al-Hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described the Quran here as Al-Hakim. Hakim means what? Wise. One meaning is wise because it is Hakim, full of wisdom. Because it is coming from Al-Hakim. Who is the source of all wisdom? Hakim also comes from Hakim, Hukum, which means what? The one who legislates, one who commands, because it is coming from the one who is authorized, who is the only authority to command. And the Quran is full of Ahkam, Hukum, commandments. Do this, don't do this. Regardless of whether it is politically correct or not. Rulings of Allah does not change. This is how it is. You like it, you don't like it, too bad. Our attitude, you know, you can't say this in front of this one, you can't say. Allah says, this is how it is, because it's coming from Him. The third meaning in Arabic of Hakim is something that's tied together perfectly. Okay. So the beginning, everything about the Quran supports itself. In a perfect way. Now, after this oath comes the jawab al qasim. This is what we are waiting for. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suppose He stopped. Wal Quran al Hakim. Now you're waiting. What is coming next? Because this is what grabs your attention. Innaka lamin al mursali. Indeed, certainly you. Now, as He said, Yasin, Surah Yasin, Allah is addressing to innaka, second person, singular male. Who is that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Innaka. You are laminal. You are la is also of taqid, certainty. So inna is taqid, certainty. La is taqid, certainty. Minal. Mursaleen. Mursaleen, those who have been sent, the messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even say sent by who. Just said, you are among those from them. Minal, Mursaleen. What is this telling Rasulullah? And let me take the next ayah also. And who are you? 
What is your qualification? Ala sirat al And you are firmly on the path that is mustaqim. Okay. Telling us that the messenger, whatever he is doing at that time. And here it is says sirat al. When we ask, we say ahde nas sirat al. We ask for asrat here, it, which is definite. The path. Here it is saying he is on a path. Because the entire Quran has not yet been revealed, but his character, even before of what you know, because the second audience is the Quraysh, that you know him. He has lived with you 40 years. You know his truthfulness. You know his honesty. You know his characteristics, all of that. And you know that that's, he's the best of you. That's a Sarat al Mustaqim. Okay? Already, without more of the revelation coming, he is already there. And then that would be perfected and completed as more and more of the revelation comes. So, why is this address to Rasulullah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, Innahu lamin al He is to the people. Allah is telling Rasulullah, you are. Because as we said, what is he hearing? Liar. Magician. Constantly hearing that propaganda. What happens to your heart? Sometimes you start to have doubts about things. Right? To reassure Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa no. There is no doubt. Inna, la. All the taqid that Allah is assuring him that I swear by the Quran, you are from those who have been sent. So first thing is to remove any doubts that might creep in as a human being from hearing all of these things over and over again, being ridiculed and ridiculed. Am I on the right thing? Reassurance and validation, giving proof that he is a messenger and Allah is t- doesn't need to take an oath. He could say, he is my messenger. He says, I swear by the Quran that he is among those who, is, who are sent. And in a way, strengthening Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that you are facing these difficulties, but you are from a brotherhood of messengers who were sent before. Mursaleen, many messengers came before. So this is not unique to you. You should feel that strength. Oh, other people came, faced the same thing. This is what is expected from people who come like this. Okay. So now you feel you belong to a certain fraternity of the chosen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who came with the message to, to people and who met with all of these same things because the same things were said to pretty much all. What did Pharaoh say to Musa alayhi salam? You're a liar. Same thing. You're a magician because of his miracles. Same things were said to all the prophets. So it's strengthening Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam that you are among those people, people who were rejected, who were challenged, who were called liars, Okay, and then it goes on as it says. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let's go ahead. Next ayah, number five Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. Tanzil, the revelation that has descended, that has been sent down. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is defining what He said before. I swear by the Quran. What is this Quran? It is not something he is reciting, he is producing. Tanzil, it came from above. It's not from this dimension. It wasn't created here. Tanzil. Tanzil is sort of a powerful statement. So it's like a bold statement. Tanzil. From who? Al Aziz. What does Al Aziz mean? Mighty, powerful. The authority who has the right to legislate and the one who is respected. Al-Aziz. That's might. That's the Jalal of Allah SWT. And the next qualification? Al-Rahim. The Jamal of Allah SWT. The mighty, the authoritative, the one with power, the one who commands respect. And Rahim. The merciful. Now you could take it from both of those, yes, because the Tanzil is from Al-Aziz. And what is the manifestation of his Rahmah? 
the one on whom it's coming. Rahmatan lil alameen. So, first ayah was swearing on the Quran, the Tanzil. Second, inna kalla min al mursaleen matches with Rahim. Because he was sent, uh, sent as, a, as a manifestation of Allah's ultimate rahmah for mankind. Not just mankind, alameen. All the worlds. So, and in that revelation, in that tanzil, in that might that is sent down, there is rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whoever gets afraid, whoever obeys, and then does the right thing, will succeed. And that's a manifestation of Allah's rahma. He becomes eligible for Allah's rahma. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the purpose why he did the tanzil. لِتُنذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ So that you may warn a people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even honor the Quraysh. Quraysh were the, the greatest tribe of Arabia. And they thought very highly of themselves. We are the guardians of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word indefinite. Sent to a people, a qom doesn't say to the qom, to the Quraysh. I'll say, Le ilafe Quraysh. But here Allah SWT doesn't even mention that this has been sent down to a people to warn them, litunzira, that you may warn them. Who are these people who take a lot of pride and arrogance on their ancestry that our father was this and that they used to remember and have long. Poetry about my father did this, my grandfather did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ma undira aba'uhum. Those ones that they have so much love and honor for, their ancestors. Fahum ghafilun. They had never received a warner. And therefore they were ghafil. They were heedless. Ghafil. Ghafla. Ultimate ghafla is what? To be? Asleep. When a person is asleep, what do you call him? Ghafil. Ghaflat ki neen mein in Urdu, right? He is sleeping so soundly that he is not aware of anything. So ghafla, when it becomes large enough or deep enough, it's like sleep. And sleep is like, like death. So spiritually, a person who is in a deep ghafla, is in a deep sleep equivalent to being almost spiritually dead. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Quraysh that you are a people. You take pride in your ancestors. We never sent them a messenger. And therefore, there was nothing to be proud of. They were in a state of ghafla. They lived in ghafla. They died in ghafla. Nothing to be proud of. Okay. Then... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this way, he is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that I have sent down this revelation. Now he is defining, calling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to his duty. What is your duty? Letunzira, that you will warn these people. Indhar, indhar, there's two we've talked about. Bashara is glad tidings. Indhar is warning. Who do you warn? To warn somebody, what should be your relationship with them? Why would you warn somebody? Because you care about them. You want them to save. He is rahmatan lil alameen. These people are rejecting him. He still wants to save them. He wants to give them warning. Look, if you don't believe, if you don't obey, if you don't you know, accept this, there are going to be consequences. What is the warning about? You're going to have a miserable life here. It's not going to be a life of what you think. It's going to be, as Allah mentions, dayyiq. You feel constricted. You may have everything of the world, all the wealth, all, and still you feel afraid. You feel anxiety. You feel stress, depression, even though you have everything. How many rich and famous and wealthy commit suicide? Because life is constricted, can't handle it. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, warn them, what warning of consequence of disbelief in this life. At the time of death, how the soul is extracted from a kafir to a believer is very different. Gentle versus fierce, like ripping something out from a thorny bush. That's how the, the soul is extracted from a kafir. And then what's going to happen? Next warning is the ahwal of the conditions of the grave. Then the next warning is what's going to happen to you on the day of judgment. And ultimately, if you think that's bad enough, Jahannam. So this is the warning that the messengers gave. Why? Why do you want to go through all this? Believe the truth. And the warning can only be given by a person who cares. So that's why when we see people who are not on deen, who are not, who have not who are not Muslims, and many of them whom have who haven't even been presented the message of Islam properly, you say kafir, he will go to Jahannam. How can you are from the Ummah of Rasul? Oh, he'll go to Jahannam. You don't care? Person hasn't even been given the message properly. Your thing should be, you should feel towards them. This is my brother or sister in humanity, can they be saved? Let me at least give them the message that might save them. Okay, that's how we should feel because we are from that ummah and no more messengers are going to come. We are the deputies. We are the messengers of rahmatullahi alameen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just remember that attitude. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ The word has already, the decree has come into effect. It has, it's become, it's been decreed already. أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ That the majority, the aksariyat, will not believe. Because Allah knows what the future is, because there is no future for him. It's all the same. He is telling Rasulullah that the majority of these people will not believe. And that was the same with previous messengers. So the question is, if it's already known, why put Rasulullah through all of this trouble? Why? One obviously is to establish a hujjah, proof, because those people who don't believe, if the message wasn't presented to them, on the day of judgment they would have an argument. Ya Allah, nobody came to tell us. Right? So now you have proof this message was presented. And number two, Allah doesn't say that all of them will not disbelieve. Akfar, that means a small minority will believe. And therefore you have to do that job presenting that Rasulullah has to go through all of these hardships and the persecution and the assassination attempt and the boycott and all of that so that the message can be delivered to those hearts that will accept it which will be a minority and the majority to make evidence against them. Yet he is telling them La yu'minun. The majority of them will not believe. So that, this is also an assurance for Rasulullah Suppose he is giving, he is doing his best job and the majority are not listening. What comes to your mind? I'm not doing my job. Right? If I was doing my job, they should be listening. So telling him, no, it's nothing to do with you not doing your job. This is how it is. These are the hearts that will not accept the message. So if the majority don't listen, don't Believe, don't get disappointed about it. Don't get depressed, distressed about it. Because as we remember in Surah Kahf, that will you kill yourself over them because they reject the message. It means don't take it personally. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us why they will not believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna ja'alna fi a'naqihim aghlalan. فَهِيَا إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna, indeed we, 
جعلنا have made for them في في أعناقهم around their necks sort of metal collars like fetters. You, have you ever seen in the old movies this big planks with metal on it with two holes in their arms? They're stuck like this. Your arms can't go in these big collars and they're carrying around like this is how you're held. Because there's a big collar here and the arms are chained in here. Which was done for who? Prisoners, right? These are prisoners, criminals, like this. And ila adqanihim up to their chin. Now, if you stick something stiff like a metal under your chin, where's your head going to be? Like this. Now, if you remove that collar, when somebody has a head like this, what is it symbolic of? Pride. Pride and arrogance. So this is a depiction that you, your pride has made you a prisoner. Your pride makes you reject the truth. You are like a prisoner. You are like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah has made you like that. Now when a person is like this, can he even look at himself? You can't even look at yourself. Look at yourself means what? What I do? What my condition is? So Allah makes you through this, ghafil about you. You can do anything. You may do the worst things. That's why we have all the dictators and all of these in the world doing horrible things. They don't see themselves because the necks up here that what I'm doing is really terrible. Allah will hold me accountable. I don't see it. So why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this? Because of their arrogance. And the ultimate arrogance is to reject the truth that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are in this, they are, this visual is given to you of a man like this, essentially helpless. He's a hell being prisoner because of his arrogance. And he can't even look at his own actions. وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ صَدًّا وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ صَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ Not only is he like this, now in case like this he sees the skies, the stars and truth comes to him by looking at the signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in front of him there is a sad, a barrier. So he can't even see anything in front. Now it's not a physical barrier. The barrier is here. So he sees all the signs. In front of him means everything in creation that you have in front is in front of you. So they see the skies, they see the stars, they see the suns, they see the morning, they see the evening, they see the seasons change, they see people, they see all everything. Yet there is a barrier that stops them from seeing that all of this comes from a creator. So in front of them, the creation is there in front of them, yet they are blind from creation. Even though the physical eyes see the creation, the eyes of the heart are blind from the creator. That yes, there is Rabbul Alameen, a creator who created all of this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made barriers for them that they will not see. No matter what argument you present, especially to the hardcore atheist, he will not believe. He will always have a counter argument. This is an accident. This is this. This is this. So Allah says, in front of them, they're in this position. One, number two, in front of them, there's a barrier. The barrier has two meanings. One, you can't escape. Sad. Number two, you can't see. You can derive the meanings of truth. Women, khalfihim, sadan. Behind them is a barrier. What is that behind them? Of what has happened in history in the past. What is behind you? Like the lessons we are talking about. What happened to the previous messengers? To the previous qawm? They are blind from that. They, doesn't, they, doesn't, they don't believe in it. Or they don't learn lessons. From it. So, so one source of reaching the truth. Which is seeing creation. They are blinded from. Second source of getting guidance from history. They are blind from. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ Now, above them, Allah has covered them. What comes from above? Tanzil, revelation. So Allah has put a cover that the Qur'an can be in front of being recited to them. It does nothing to them. 
So because of that arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has eliminated all three of these means through which a person can be guided. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ They will not see. And when you're talking about not see, doesn't mean that I don't see you and I don't see you and I don't see I don't see the truth. I don't see the hand of the creator behind creation. I stop at the creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the basis why the hearts are sealed. Elsewhere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that we put seals on their heart. Means no matter what is presented, it will not penetrate. Because of what they bring to the table. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again, وَالسَّوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُهُمْ it is all the same whether you warn them or whether you don't warn them. La yu'minun. Again the same. They will not believe. Again, comes back to the same. Whether I warn them or I don't warn them, they will not believe. Then why should I go about warning them? Because there is a small percentage. Because you have to establish a hujjah. Evidence that it was presented. So you still need to do the job. Who believes? between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our job, because we are from this final ummah, is the same. We have to convey this message through our akhlaq, through our words, clearly deliver the message clearly, beautifully, gently, without argument, without insult, and show it in our character so that the proof has been established that this is what we did. And then we would have been we would have fulfilled the rights of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on us. One of those. So Allah says, "Wasawa on alim." It is all the same for them, whether you warn them or you don't warn them, they will not believe. Then who is going to believe? Inna ma tunziru man ittaba'a dhikra wa khashya rahman bil ghayb. Fabashirhu bi maghfiratin wa ajrin kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, only those will take the warning, will heed the warning. Who? What is that? What do they do? What is their characteristic? Man, all those, indefinite. Ittaba'a dhikr. Those, what is this ad dhikr? The Quran. One of the names of the Quran is ad dhikr. The reminder. Man ittaba'a, who does, does ittiba'a, who follows, who obeys the Qur'an. So, a person who obeys the Qur'an will take the warning. One who rejects that, who has it but doesn't, may not take that warning. So that's one characteristic. And how does he show that? A khashiyar rahman. He has fear. Fear of who? Look at the beauty. He didn't say of all Aziz, of Ar Rahman. Bil Ghaib. Ghaib means in the unseen. So one meaning is that he is afraid. He knows Allah is Ar Rahman, but he is still afraid. And he, he, in Ghaib, because he doesn't see Ar Rahman, he doesn't see Allah. In, because Allah is in the Ghaib, right? Why is he afraid of Ar Rahman? He's afraid that maybe I am the one who is going to be deprived of the Rahma of a Rahman. That I might do something that I become bereft of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So he's always afraid. I don't want to do anything that Allah's mercy would be lifted from me. Bil Ghaib. The other meaning is that this person is in the Ghaib and he's still afraid. In other words, I am alone. Nobody can see me. And in that moment also, I behave in a way that I'm aware of Allah. I have khashiyah of Ar-Rahman. When I'm alone, nobody else sees. I mean, I'm not going to do anything horrible if every, in front of all of you. But do I behave the same way? Or even better, when I'm alone, when nobody can see me. I don't do anything wrong. Why? Because I have khashiyah, that fear of Ar-Rahman. 
So these are the people who will take <clears throat> the warning. <clears throat> so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبَشِّرْهُ The other one was given warning. This one is being given glad tidings. Bashara. بَشِّرْهُ Give him. Doesn't even say, بَشِّرْهُمْ Them. Because there are so few. بَشِّرْهُ what is the Bashara that is being given first? You are afraid of Ar-Rahman. You are afraid because of your sins. Give him Bashara what? Maghfira. Allahu Akbar. On the Day of Judgment, when we are presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what's going to be the most stressful thing? What am I bringing? What the book's going to show? It's not going to be about my good deeds. It's going to be about my bad deeds, about my sins, right? So, <clears throat> that is going to be the cause of the biggest stress, my sins. With what am I going to meet my Rabb? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't be stressed out. Give him the Bashara first of what? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. And then comes, wa ajrin kareem. You want Jannah? I'll give you Jannah. But don't be stressed out about your sins. Because you're dealing with Ar-Rahman, you're dealing with Ghaffar, you're dealing with Ghafur, you're dealing with Al-Afu, who loves to forgive, who loves to erase sins, who wants to change your sins into good deed with your Tawbah. But come to him. Come to him. So this is the Bashara that's being given. Don't worry about whatever you have done. Even if you have filled the space from the earth to the heavens with your sinful acts, but you come to Allah with sincere tawbah, Allah will meet you with greater forgiveness than that. This is the hadith of Qudsi. Okay? So there is no reason for a Muslim to be disappointed, distressed, depressed by their sins. It doesn't mean that you continue to sin. It just means that don't let it stop you. Because shaitan comes, you know, you have no hope. You keep doing tawbah, you keep doing sins, you know. Just do whatever you want because you are not going to be. No. I am dealing with Allah. Afar. Rahman. Allah will forgive. Ajrun Kareem. And that is the ultimate reward. Everything that Jannah has been described with in its spiritual meanings, in its physical meanings, and the, finally the ru'ya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ultimate of pleasures of paradise when we shall inshallah see our Rabb, Rabbul Alameen. And the last ayah that I will cover today, which will finish this section, is ayah number 12. After all of these descriptions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and says, Inna nahnu nuhyil mawta. Indeed we, nahnu nuhyil mawta. We will bring the death, dead to life. We bring the dead to life. We, it is he, it is we who bring the dead to life. وَنَكْتُبُ ma قَدَّمُ And we are the one who record what ma قَدَّمُ What they have sent for the future. Your deeds. Good deeds and bad deeds. What we are doing is being recorded and it will be presented to us there. What we have sent be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we write it down. When Allah writes it down, there can be no mistake, there can be no omissions, nothing is missed. Ma qaddamu wa atharahum. Athar are the relics, the things that we leave behind. Okay? Like the ruins we leave behind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have also written down what you've sent for tomorrow and what you have left behind. What do we leave behind? You could have left behind a masjid that you built. You could have left behind a hospital that you built. You could have left behind a well from which people are drinking. You may have built a madarsa. You may have written a book from which people benefit. You may have left videos that from people benefit. You may have left righteous, pious children who will worship Allah. You may have left a charitable trust to take care of orphans and help the poor and needy. Or you may have left evil things behind. 
from which more evil grows. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you have left behind, your footprints on this earth are also recorded. This ayah was also recited by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. Now remember this is the Makkan surah. In Medina, there was a tribe of Banu Salim who said, we live far from the masjid. Banu Salma, we live far from the masjid. They found a piece of land near Masjid al Nabawi. They wanted to move there. This news was brought to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Ya Banu Salma, stay where you are because Allah yaktubu athar. Allah records your footsteps to the masjid. And you have reward for every. So stay there, don't come near because there is a reward for every step. So they accepted. They said, No, we have no desire to move. We'll stay there. We'll travel the extra distance for the extra rewards. So because of that, this incident and this, some people thought that these, this ayah was revealed in Medina. But it doesn't mean that because ayahs revealed before could have been re recited again by Rasulullah just like we do today. When something happens, we recite a certain ayah. That doesn't mean it's being recited. It's being revealed right there and then. So anyway, so that was then the last part of the ayah, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْسَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And kulla shay, when Allah says, means every single thing, every glance, every word, every action. أَحْسَيْنَاهُ Detailed recording. It has been recorded, enumerated, like, you know, spreadsheet of everything. فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ What is imam? What is an imam? That is somebody... In front of you. In front of you will be a record on the day of judgment of what? Everything that you did. Everything. Now that itself is a scary thought, isn't it? Every single thing, every word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here that. He transitioned from all of those warnings suddenly to the day of judgment that this is what's going to happen. We will bring you back to life. There will be a day of judgment. Everything is being recorded. Everything will be presented to you in front of you in an open book. Clear register. Does it include thoughts? So thoughts will come and go. Allah does not hold you accountable for them as long as you don't act on them as long as you don't dwell on them as long as you don't enjoy those thoughts which are not worthy okay as long as you are trying your best to repel those thoughts but yet they come this is the ayah that was revealed in the end of surah baqarah when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la yukallifu allah nafsan illa usra okay so that allah does not uh, burden a soul with more than what they can bring because this was in response to what the sahaba after the earlier ayah of surah baqarah had come that allah knows what you hide what you reveal and he will go. they said ya rasulullah we are destroyed because we can control what we say what we do but thoughts come how can we then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you should not be like previous nations samana wa atana you should say we hear and we obey even though it seems impossible then Allah revealed out of his mercy that ayah that no soul is burdened. Allah forgives. So, but everything that we do and say is recorded and recorded in a way that nothing is omitted. So this is also in a way a threat for the Quraysh because that's the other audience. Everything you are doing is going to be presented to you. And it's a reassurance to the one being addressed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that all their crimes against you are not going to be omitted, they are being recorded. So this is the first part of this, this surah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to benefit from it and reflect on it and to memorize it and go back in time now that we've been to Makkah and all that this is where it was coming, this is where it was revealed. 
these were the circumstances and then apply to us now I am here how do I apply these ayahs so you should reflect on that and share that with us next time and then we'll go on to the next section inshallah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the time and ability in life in inshallah two weeks time سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم